finally, after minutes of delay. Here we go. That and then that. Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast, brought to you by Stanfield Hunting Outfitters. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world-famous Andy Shaver. Yes, sir. Went scout turkeys this morning. They are gobbling on the roost, so it won't be won't be long. We get fired up this weekend, so I'm excited. I'm excited. A little moisture this morning, it looked like, at the lodge. Yep. A little bit of rain last night, which is God blessing. Had a good rain the night before. South of us in the peanut country had a half inch of rain, and boy, we need it. Pray for rains for Texas and western Oklahoma. And I think Western Kansas and Western Nebraska and Western Dakotas and everywhere else. With us on the phone today, Mr. Brian Richards with the U.S. Geological Service. And he is the, I guess, the expert on the avian flu. Brian, how are you, sir? I'm doing all right. Is and that- hey, as long as you're praying for rain, you know, could you continue that northward? Because, you know, last couple, uh, last year and this winter were exceptionally dry. And we'd take some of that moisture as well. So even in Wisconsin, y'all are in a drought right now? I don't know how the, you know, the technical term for what, you know, whether it's a drought or not, but, you know, out in the, out in the, uh, upper Great Plains, like, you know, South Dakota, North Dakota, we're in, you know, disastrous type, you know, drought situations last fall. Obviously that's got implications for, you know, some of the ducks and puddle areas out there, but we were dry. We're not as dry as some other areas in the country. Uh, but you know, if you run out of water pretty quick if you're digging a hole. Put it that way. It's right. uh, western Western Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas are as bad as we were almost in 2011. No, the, uh, we are dry. We've got we've got Our plenty lakes. of drinking water. No, no, no. That's right. Our lake water is good because we were at 100 percent to 90 percent in most of our lakes out here, just within the last year or so. But the actual farming rains, we are behind. behind way. We're way behind. Now. Way, way bad. In 2011, they we were, our community was having conversations of. That's because it was. Where a, are we going to get our drinking water right. from? So it's apples and oranges at this point. We, but we've had four inches of rain. I looked at the, the charts the other day. We've had four inches of rain most all of the Texas and Texas Panhandle since last July. That's on the same level that we were in 2011. The right. problem in 2011, in 2008, and 9, and 7, we didn't get any runoff rains. Right. And if this, if this drought, if the, if, the, if it is just dry right now, if it's like that towards next August, we're going to be talking the same way. Mm-hmm. But luckily, we are in good shape for drinking water. But people don't notice a drought when it happens in the fall and winter near like they do in the summertime. Right, right. Yeah, this winter, we... Uh you know, usually you get a couple of really solid snowfalls up here in southwestern Wisconsin. And, and while we had white cover, you know, pretty well through most of the winter, we never got a, a 10 or 12 inch event. Now, obviously, when you melt that down, it doesn't amount to much, but you come into the spring and we're, we're behind already. Now, you know, just making that statement, I, I, you know, I looked outside this morning, went outside at five o'clock with the dog and there's about, you know, half inch of fresh snow on the ground. So, you know, it, I, I'm not sure. Well, this is the end of March. So it came in, I guess, like a lamb. And if this is all it's going to be for a lion going out, well, that's not all that bad. You know? Yeah. It's supposed to be 70 in a couple of days. So that's it. The temperature swings are, are- crazy this time of year like i was telling you it was 95 here a couple days ago and then now it's in the 70s but everybody's allergies are going to be acting up and you know you lived in texas how were your when you lived here did you like wake up in the springtime and like oh my god my allergies are just going bonkers right now no but my kids did um yeah i mentioned i think yeah 
I don't know if I, there's truth to it, but you know, I grew up on a farm. And so literally from the time I was a few weeks old, I was exposed to probably, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, around, around cattle and, and, and hogs and things like that. And knock on wood, my immune system seems to still hold up very good, vigorously knocking on wood that <laughs> is. And I've never had allergy issues, but my sons, you know, each have, you know, some seasonal allergy, allergy type issues. So, but yeah, you, you're right, boy, in Central Texas, um, it sure kicks in this time of year. We get guides from all over during waterfowl season, and we hunt a lot of peanut fields, and there's we hunt the straw that's left over after they harvest it, and the guys will just wake up in the morning, their eyes are just, you just tell they're all red and puffy and ro- nose is running, and yeah, I know what got you. So now we've kind of got COVID is kind of dipping a little bit, and now we've got this new... We've got the bird flu. Now, my question to you is, is this how scared should we be as waterfowl hunters? And um, is this, because the last time was what, we saw bird flu in what, 2014? Is that the last time? And then 2003, I believe, if my research is right? Roughly? Yeah, last yeah, last time we had a, uh, a uh, an outbreak of of highly pathogenic avian influenza was 2014 2015, and that one seemed to have come in you know along the along the Pacific Flyway along the West Coast, and then and where we saw relatively minor impacts, saw a few wild bird positives, things like that. And then it, it made its way over into the Midwest where we saw some substantial impacts you know, on commercial poultry operations. Um, I think it all told by the end of you know, the spring of 2015, I think we were someplace in the, in the total of around 50 million you know, commercial poultry lost, either to disease or depopulation. And the economic impacts of that were measured in, in the billions of dollars. Um, but very minor wild bird impacts in that last outbreak. You know, we saw a few situations where uh, we'd have, have a few a handful of water birds and then with, with highly pathogenic avian influenza, you tend to see uh, individual raptors, you know, dying out on the landscape. And so where they're getting it is from, you know, they're eating, you know, consuming a diseased, you know, carcass of a diseased, you know, duck or waterfowl typically. And where these viruses traditionally don't seem to have a lot of impact on, on waterfowl, water birds, uh, they have a tremendous impact at the individual bird level on raptors that consume them. Right? So that was the last time around. This one seems to be a little bit different. Right? So, so the first time um, this, this particular lineage of virus, H5N1, we can talk about what that means you know, um, momentarily. You know, it, the first place it showed up was in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, first in uh, what was referred to, I think, as an exhibition facility, multi-bird exhibition facility on the Avalon Peninsula. And then um, uh, is several great black back gulls that had presented with neurological signs. They'd been turned into wildlife rehabilitators in Newfoundland and Labrador back in November of last year, but it just took a while for the testing you know, to, you know, to be done and realized. So those were our first cases. And then it didn't take long, and we saw cases in wild birds, but most of these were healthy wild birds. These were part of, of surveillance looking for high path AI. And you know, it was detected all the way down, you know, the coast of the Atlantic Flyway, you know, all the way from Newfoundland Labrador all the way down to Florida. Then the next thing we saw was early in February. Uh, I think the first week of February, the first commercial facility popped up, and that was in southwestern Indiana, Du Bois County. So disease had popped from the Atlantic Flyway over to, you know, basically the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers. And so then we started seeing it in multiple commercial facilities and some wild birds there, backyard flocks. Most recently, We've seen cases of, you know, detections of the virus or disease itself in, in water birds or wild birds, backyard flocks and commercial facilities, you know, moving straight up the Missouri River. And now, you know, I think there's at least a dozen 
uh, commercial turkey facilities in South Dakota where it's been detected and depopulation ongoing. Uh, and we've also got you know, at least a couple wild bird mortality events in, in, in North Dakota for that northern reach right now. Uh, yesterday, the first um, uh, backyard flock in the state of Wyoming you know, was, was confirmed and announced by USDA. So it's, it's just kind of came down the, uh, the, you know, very rapidly came down the Atlantic Flyway on the wings of wild birds, uh, popped over into the, into the Mississippi Flyway, and then, uh, and then took a left-hand turn along the Missouri River, and it's, and it's very firmly in the Central Flyway right now. So, and I mean, in the briefest of nutshells, that's what we're looking at right now. What's the long-term but, um, effect? I'm sorry. On, uh, on wild birds? Yes. All right. Interesting question. Avian influenza viruses evolve and, and actually are, are belong in wild birds. But those low pathogenic avian influ- influenza viruses don't cause any sort of outward illness in waterfowl. Right? So when these low pathogenic viruses spill into commercial poultry facilities, they can mutate and change into what's referred as to as this highly pathogenic form. And by definition, the term highly pathogenic avian influenza refers to a virus's capability to kill poultry, not to kill wild birds. So historically, these high path viruses, you know, when they when they occur or evolve inside of, of high, you know, high number, high density poultry facilities, they'll kill a lot of birds there. And historically, we rarely see a spill back into wild birds. But when it did spill back into wild birds, it didn't persist. So that changed. Um, over the course of the last couple of decades. And now we've got, you know, this lineage of highly pathogenic avian influenza, which spilled from poultry back into wild birds. It typically doesn't cause substantial mortality in our water birds, waterfowl, you know, the ducks, geese, and swans, uh, but it can persist. And so now we've seen these viruses persist in wild water birds. Now, up until a year ago, We'd suggest that impacts to wild birds, while they can be great for the individual, right? The individual bald eagle or red-tailed hawk that, that consumes one is likely going to die. But the impacts on waterfowl themselves have been minuscule. This year, I think the, you know, the, the book is open still. The crystal ball doesn't, look, doesn't really predict into the future. But this virus lineage seems to be behaving differently. So we've had a a wild bird, uh, waterfowl, duck mortality event in Brevard County, Florida, where it's claimed over a thousand lesser scoff. That's a pretty big number. Now, from a population standpoint, it's not that big, but it's a pretty big number of ducks to succumb to high path AI in a given location. Up in New Hampshire, Um, We've got a single Canada goose event where over 50, you know, Canada geese, um, you know, succumb to high path AI. Again, at the population level, it's not that much. But for those individual birds, you know, it did have substantial impacts. Most recently now, we've seen um, some pretty good sized morbidity mortality events going up the central flyway, starting from, you know, Kansas and then moving north into Nebraska South Dakota, North Dakota, and certainly those are going to, you know, swing right up into the prairie provinces as well. Now, we see cholera events, avian cholera events in those light geese populations, not every year. Uh, Well, we probably see some small ones every year, and once in a while you see some bigger events. So we've heard of, of, of morbidity, mortality events all the way up through those, through those plain states, you know, numbering in, you know, 1,000 birds here, 800 there, 1,500 at the next one. And so it's likely that we've got a combination. We've probably got some avian cholera in some of these morbidity, mortality events, die-offs or wild bird die-offs. But what's different this year is we seem to have quite a few birds that are showing the clinical signs of high path AI, neurological signs. You know, they'll let you walk right up to them and, you know, head bobbing back and forth. Um, they're, they're, they're under the throes of disease. 
So again, you know, we think about these impacts are a little bit different, but at the population level, you know, you remember with light geese, how, how many years have we had, you know, the so-called conservation seasons, right? When I was growing up, we didn't have conservation seasons for light geese, but we've had them the last 20 years or so. And those are a corrective action on, on the part of us, you know, duck hunters as managers, you know, to try and, and, and get those populations in check because snow geese are really hard on the breeding grounds, right? And so at, from a population sense, it's hard to suggest that high path AI will be limiting at the population level, at, the, at least at the continental level. But certainly we can anticipate smaller scale impacts with these birds. That was a long drawn out answer, but it takes no. a little background to get there. My apologies. Right. No, it makes sense. Um, it's so, cause you know, it seems, and I don't know if, if, if this is just so different, if it, if this feels different to waterfowl hunters, because back in 2014, 15, the internet's not what it is today. So it seems like anytime you go on social media sites, especially for hunters that follow that look, you're seeing another lake in North Dakota that has, you're seeing this uh, high path AI where the snow geese are just laying there and they're bobbing their head. And, and I don't know if, if this just feels different because social media is so much uh, more, uh, more lar larger than it was in 2014. I think the COVID deal has got a lot to do with it now. As people We're are all so, just kind of on high alert for the next apocalypse. I, I think people are on high alert, and I think people have a lot of trust issues with our government. And I don't mean government employees like you. I meant the people running. And they don't know. No, nobody knows what the, what's going on anymore and what the target is. And nobody knows if this is a man-made deal that's put on because I don't – I had a guy tell me this. He called me yesterday. And he said, I told him you were going to be on here. And I talked about the other day that we were going to, I told somebody else and, and some people have asked me about it. And he's like, well, I think the government's just trying to kill all the chicken farms and make it so the food will go away. I mean, that's the, that's the, that, a lot of people have that kind of thoughts right now that they just attack in the poultry business because they want to make us dependent on the government for food. Well, it could wipe out the chicken industry pretty quick and it's already hard to get eggs and chicken as it is. Interesting, interesting theories. Um, <laughs> Yeah, social media, media make things travel a lot quicker than they used to. I think this one is different. Um, and, and, and if you've been, and I've had the opportunity, you know, with, with the business I'm in, you know, monitoring wildlife health, we've been watching this. So, so this particular lineage, you know, of highly pathogenic avian influenza, the first time it was observed was in Southeast Asia back in 1997. And it's morphed and changed over time. And if you'll recall, you know, uh, H5N1, some of the, you know, the first alerts were back in the early 2000s when there was discussion, could this virus become a pandemic, you know, impacting, impacting humans at a very large scale. And in those early, you know, 2000s years, uh, there were, you know, human impacts spillover from largely from domestic poultry in Southeast Asia into humans. And I think all in all, um, you know, close to, you know, 500, you know, humans um, died from H5N1. And the case fatality rate was exceptionally high, you know, something like 60%. You know, so if you got H5N1 from being too close to your chickens that were infected, um, if you got disease, you had a better than 50-50 chance of dying. Now, over time, we've watched this particular lineage of highly pathogenic you know, viruses um, shift and morph through time, but it's never really gone away. It's been present periodically, sporadically, you know, in Southeast Asia, in, uh, in poultry. Uh, you mentioned we talked very briefly about the incursion into North America in 2014, 2015. You know, certainly wild birds brought it here. They brought it to the vicinity, but then how it gets from, you know, from the wild birds inside of the inside of the poultry facilities remains an open question in, in many cases. But the last couple of years have been really interesting. If you watch this on a global basis, um, H5N1 and some other high path viruses have, have remained very viable and moved into Europe where they're uh, persisting and causing impacts in both, um, in both the commercial sector and in the wild bird sector. 
So we were watching this as it seems to be growing and ebbing and flowing in Europe. And so here in the United States, you know, under the, you know, under the guidance of our, of our, of our high path avian influenza steering committee with USDA, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, you know, the Flyway Council, North American Flyway Council and USGS, you know, surveillance was ramped up because we could see this thing, you know, building in Europe and to a degree in Asia. So the idea was let's keep surveillance up. Let's ramp it up for that early detection. We figured it was a good chance it was going to come across the pond from the west or from the east or maybe both directions. So it made a lot of sense to do to ramp up this surveillance to provide that early notification, early detection, situational awareness for, you know, largely for, you know, for the industry for the poultry industry, recognizing that the impacts can be so great and the economic consequences as well. But as mentioned, this is a little different. You know, the last couple of years, we've seen wild bird impacts that we haven't seen before. Here's a case in point. This last winter, um, approximately 8,000 common cranes in Israel died, okay, out of a wintering population of 40,000. Now, historically, these common cranes wintered all across Africa, but more recently, you know, they were short stopped. And that's a common thing. You know, waterfowl hunters ought to know what, you know, the definition of short stopping, Mm -hmm. where birds that historically went further south now find adequate wintering habitat, you know, for more in the mid latitudes. Well, this has happened with cranes as well. So, so in that situation in Israel, you had extremely high density of common cranes that are being artificially fed, right? They're maintained there artificially. So when you've got cranes that are, you know, packed in at that kind of density and artificially fed, you greatly enhance, you know, the odds for disease transmission. So you sprinkle a little bit of avian influenza inside of that situation and the virus did very, very well. You know, took out 20% of those cranes, and that's a fantastic number of cranes where you start seeing impacts. So a little bit different. I'm not sure it's cause for alarm as far as impacts on wild birds, but this one is definitely acting differently, and it's cause for vigilance, you know, paying attention, and certainly for, for hunters to respect that, you know, there's a there's a possibility that this fall um, during you know duck hunting seasons this virus could easily come down from the breeding grounds we have no idea whether it will whether it won't what it'll look like and and certainly the state and federal and provincial agencies will be on the lookout for this to provide the best you know notice we can you know out to that hunting community and there's you know some simple things that you know cdc and the states and the federal government recommend that hunters can do to be aware you know, and help protect themselves. Um, this, the lineage most recently um, has been really well behaved with regard to impacting humans. Back in the early 2000s, we saw, you know, a substantial number of human cases. But in the last year, I'm only aware of two human cases of H5N1. One was last fall in India. And the last one was in Great Britain. That was back in December of this last year. And that situation in Great Britain was an individual who literally lived with some of his pet ducks inside the house. Mm. Oh my God. So that really tight <laughs> confine. So, you know, an unfortunate incident, but that, that was a replicate of what we saw in the early 2000s in Southeast Asia. Those humans who had the highest risk of exposure with, were those that lived, you know, literally lived with chickens in the living room, right? So, and, and so certainly, you know, waterfowl hunters probably are not in that category. <laughs> but, you know, after when you're field dressing birds, you know, you're up close and personal, right? So mm-hmm. there's some common sense precautions that help address any potential risk. But the CDC has identified with this particular lineage the risk to humans is pretty low, but it's not zero. We never want to say it's zero and let our guard down, right? Right. Now, some of these precautions, would it be uh, wearing rubber gloves when you clean these animals? Because um, one thing I had read, it can come in through your eyes and your nose. So, I mean, avoid scratching and all that stuff with bloody hands or what, what precautions 
could we take? Yeah, yeah, I think you, I think you nailed it. And so I got to give you the caveat. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a human health specialist. Understood. And I don't even play one on the weekends, right? <laughs> Understand. So I always refer people for the best guidance out to places like our Centers for Disease Control. And if anybody, you know, just Google CDC, avian influenza, hunters, and you'll find their guidance. It includes some obvious things, you know, uh, you know, don't, don't shoot or handle, you know, sick or dead ducks, you know, out there on the landscape. Um, after you're done handling game, yeah, wear, uh, wear disposable gloves when you're, when you're field dressing game, you know, after you're done handling them, you know, wash with soap and water or a hand sanitizer that everybody's got a, a bottle of that in their truck now, yep. you know, we might not have used to, but we, but we do now. Um, you know, the, the, you know, cook your game well, don't, don't mix your uncooked meat with cooked meat, you know, in the kitchen, things like that. And the other real, you know, common sense precautions include if you have backyard fowl at home, right? So if you, you know, I've got backyard chickens here and I really enjoy having the egg supply, uh, but uh, consciousness there, you know, is, is it's worth a lot. So if you're out in the field and you're wearing waders out in the field, you know, don't walk into your chicken house at home because right. you have an enhanced chance of bringing virus. So, so kind of some common sense things. Uh, the other one I think you, you mentioned is while you're, while you're dressing your ducks, uh, don't be eating, drinking, smoking or anything at the time. So the last thing you want to do is have your hand inside of a duck and then your hand next to your mouth, mm -hmm. right? Cause you're, you're just, increasing any potential risk there might be right and that's kind of for anything like whatever it doesn't even have to be this virus it could just be whatever germs happen to be on that duck like they you know ducks and geese like to sit on sewage treatment facilities so i mean do you really want to be opening that duck up and then take a big old drag off of your cigarette and introduce all that into your mouth what, yep what's you know disposable gloves are really amazing things you and know cheap. i grow up you know, hunting. Yeah, really cheap. I grew up hunting deer and, you know, I mean, field dressing deer. And then you got everything in your uncle underneath your fingernails. It's cold out. And boy, these things called disposable gloves are wonderful. You know, you peel them off and your hands are dry and clean. You know, yeah. throw them in a Ziploc baggie and carry it out in your pocket. Just what an amazing invention. <laughs> and, you know, from a from a health and safety protocol, they, they work wonders as well. Yeah. What do you, uh, well, um, the amazing thing, I haven't been around very many chicken barns, but I've been around some hog barns. We, there's some up in Oklahoma by where we hunt. <laughs> mm -hmm. You got to put on a sanitized suit, go through a spray chemicals to even go in or out of the barn. And I'm assuming the chicken farms, cause there's so much money tied up in those chicken farms would be the same way. It's amazing that these, this wild flu, bird flu is getting, or not, not wild bird, avian blue bird flu is getting in these chicken houses. Cause I'm sure their protocol is, is just as as tough as the hog farms are somebody probably just got careless but i mean you're talking about wiping out because if it gets right. in a if it gets in a, a chicken farm like that they got to kill all the chickens don't they right um yeah anytime um you know virus gets in or high path virus gets into these commercial poultry operations they're depopulated and you know it's for a couple good <laughs> reasons well main one is not to let that virus go Right. Because it can then be transported to other facilities, spill back into wild birds. The other thing is when you've got these very large commercial poultry operations, they're kind of like Petri dishes. So if you allow a virus inside there to persist, that virus could change into something quite unpredictable. But you raise a, you raise a really interesting question. And I've seen you know media articles and. and you know, certainly in this instance, there's no question that wild birds are moving, you know, this virus around, okay, in their, in their droppings, in their saliva. So there's no doubt that wild birds, waterfowl, are bringing it into the neighborhood of these, you know, commercial facilities and the backyard flocks as well. But how it gets inside the barn, like I said, is an open question. Right. Because you nailed it. I mean, the biosecurity protocols at these large, you know, production facilities where you got sometimes millions of birds, they're incredible. They're, they're doing, you know, I think they're doing a great job, but sometimes virus finds a way in. How it gets in, we really don't know. We really don't know. 
But as of right now, I'm just looking at the data now. We've got, uh, as of yesterday, 47 commercial facilities in the United States confirmed with a total of 16.9 million births. So the last time in 2014, in 2014, 2015, we hit about 50 million birds. So we're, you know, I guess my math isn't very good, but we're a third of the, of the way there right now. So it'll just be interesting to see what unfolds through the next couple months. Um, it was pointed out to me yesterday that the substantial um, poultry impacts in 2015 happened kind of in April. And so we're just in March right now. So we're a little bit ahead um, certainly this is headed north on the, on the wings of, of wild birds. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether, you know, how the impacts continue in the commercial sector in the United States and heads up for anybody in the, uh, uh, in, in Canada, you know, this thing's coming your way. Uh-huh. And so we anticipate on the, on the wings of light geese, it's probably in the prairie provinces by now. And we've also seen initial impacts in Southern Ontario. So certainly it's, it's headed north with migration. So, so I want to go back. I want to make sure I heard you. How many birds did you say have been impacted in the United States already? 16 million. 16 million. What's the total population of birds? No, chickens. That was oh, chickens. I mean chickens. No, chickens. I, I mean, I know chickens. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. How many, so 16 million chickens have already been affected in the United States, right? Yes. 16.9, just under 17 and, million. And there, did you say there's only 50 million in the no, United States? No, it peaked at 50 oh, million. Oh, no, no that, was in, that was in the last outbreak. There so were, were 50 a, million we're impacted. We're a third of the way there already. How many, bird, how many chickens right. do we have in production in the United States right now, do you think? Oof. I couldn't even venture a guess. But I bet if you, you know, I bet a Google search would, would probably get you that in, in short order. Right. So I, I couldn't venture to guess. That's an ag question. I'm going to look that up because I'm curious to see if we have a billion <laughs> birds. I'm just curious to what the effect is right now, because if we've got a half a million birds, we're talking three percent of the population's already been affected. We get up to 10, 20 percent cost of a damn chicken is going to be 20 bucks. We do see economic consequences, and that's why that's one of the main reasons that you know, the government, state and federal government take avian influenza so seriously because of the impacts on the poultry production sector and the economic consequences. So in addition to the losses from the sector itself, we also look at um, the export market um, because it's, it, you know, once you have identified confirmed high path avian influenza in the production sector, you know, in, at state or county local levels, um, some foreign countries will typically respond with with bans on imports from those geographic areas. So it compounds, you know, the economic consequences. And it all ties back together. You talked about the incredible biosecurity at these individual farms. Well, number one, it's to protect their livelihood and their stock at that farm. But it's also to prevent, you know, or to help protect, you know, the economy associated with, you know, with with production. We right. have we have Big consequence. population in April was five hundred and eighteen point three million chickens. So three percent of our po- we've lost three percent to this flu already. But it said that nine billion chicken chicks are raised in the United States every year. So there's half there's three, half a billion chickens and nine billion chicks. There's nine billion chicks chickens are raised for flesh each year, and three hundred and five million chicks are raised for their eggs. So. I don't know how you, I don't, the numbers just, it, it's crazy how you, the numbers, but somewhere around probably 600 million chickens are alive right now. Cause I mean, I don't think a chicken has but a 30 to 90 day cycle from the time they're raised till the time they're, they're sitting on your block at your butcher. Right. I don't know how long it gets. So, so that population rolls all the time, but I think at any given time, every day there's probably 600 million chickens in the United States. So we've lost 3% of our chickens already to this, to this influenza so it's going to be a major food impact if it and <clears> it's <throat> a it's a cheap protein for a lot of families like yeah. if, you, if you look like chicken is probably the main the mainstay for a lot of families out there they probably have it four or five times a week just because it, it, the cost of beef is a- astronomical but chicken is cheap cheap protein for a and lot it's of people. healthier for you it's healthier chicken and pork are the two main things that that, that offset for people that don't eat grub worms I mean, that's basically the next cheap protein there is. But, <clears throat> and this is going to affect the turkeys, everything. 
I mean, it's a, this is a very serious problem for our country. It's a it's a substantial outbreak right now. Um, I don't know if you guys have, have looked at our National Wildlife Health Center website. If you you know if any of you or your readers or listeners rather, uh, if you just Google National Wildlife Health Center on our homepage right now, there's a link to you know a map that I'm producing myself, putting a dot on the map for every detection, confirmed detection, either in wild birds, backyard poultry, or commercial. And right now you'll take a look, and that's in the United States and Canada as well. And that map has changed pretty pretty quickly. It's changing right now. But just at the at that level, when you take a look at it, it goes boom, you know? Um, yeah, there's a lot of it out there. I said, this one's different. This one's different. Let yep. me ask you this. So right now, the only way that a human can get this disease is prolonged exposure with that infected animal. But it's not from eating that animal. Like you said, a raptor, if a raptor eats a, dece- a diseased bird, the raptor then gets it. But that has not been the case in humans, correct? That is correct. Um, especially if you, you know, if you cook your, you know, your poultry or your, your wild fowl well. You know, that's going to kill the virus in these things. Any potential exposure, in, you know, is, is going to be for a hunter right when you harvest that animal or when you're dressing that animal. The, as I said, you know, the, the indication is the risk is, is low, you know, with this particular lineage, but it's not zero. And there's things that hunters can do to mitigate, you know, any risk out there. But cooking your game is probably not a bad idea across the board regardless of what that (laughs) wild game is yeah yeah um what is the when do you start seeing the um the effects of this disease in birds is it a long onset to like where the bird could have it for up to a month and then start exhibiting symptoms or is it within a month a couple days a week Pretty short incubation period. You know, I don't have exact <clears throat> precise numbers for you, but um, if a, if that bald eagle, you know, uh, is is scavenging, you know, a pile of dead um, snow geese on a on a frozen pond or next to a pond, it's probably a matter of a few days. Um, we've seen instances where, you know, it's probably two three days in that situation. It's a very acute disease where once it gets into the brain of these animals, you start seeing, you know, neurologic signs. And when you start seeing those in an ego, you know, it's probably done. Right. It's probably done. Um, same thing. I, I think, you know, the incubation period in waterfowl is going to be on the shorter side. It's not a month. Let's put it that way. It's more measured in days than it is in, in longer time frames. But now many wild waterfowl are going to be just fine you know likely from this virus they're going to just carry it around and others due to probably a a a set of of criteria that we don't fully understand are going to succumb to this particular disease right and that's new and different like i said this lineage is a little bit different where you know, and you, and you mentioned it earlier, and I've seen some videos as well of snow geese that, you know, let you walk right up to them, yeah. you know, and their head bobbing back and forth, and they don't know what's going on. Now, those are those birds are going to die, but they haven't been sick, visibly sick for all that long, so fairly acute disease. And I mentioned, you know, also earlier, you know, we, we, we likely have some cholera going on. And in some of these events, it's probably a combination of these two, you know, pathogens. But historically, you think when you hear about a cholera die-off, you find a lot of dead geese. You don't find any sick ones because that disease is so acute that birds can literally drop out of formation out of the sky dead with cholera. Wow. You know, the clinical phase of that disease is measured in hours. And so uh, you could see a healthy population at a, at a refuge, you know, on a, on a, on a lake or, what, or uh, impoundment, whatever the case may be, of thousands and thousands of geese one day. And the next morning, you've got a couple thousand dead, right? That's how quick cholera works. So now this year, some of these mortality events, you know, a few of them we've seen, you know, 1,000, 1,500 so birds where there's a lot of dead birds there. But there's also, you know, a pretty good number of these light geese that are suffering from neurologic signs. 
And to me, that's a, at least a pretty good suggestion that you probably got both going on, that some of these birds likely die of cholera, but the ones that are, that are walking around a little bit wonky, right, that's not cholera. That's more than likely the high path AI. Mm-hmm. My, uh, th- this is just com- – I'm lost here when I'm, I'm trying to say this. The birds that right now, birds are grouped up in these big groups. When they, get to, are. When they get to Canada, they're going to spread out. And they're going to get to the nesting pairs, and they're going to do it, except for the, the snow geese, which all stay in these big masses. Is this good? When, when they spread out in Canada, that's better for the birds, isn't it, than what we're dealing with right now where they're flocked up big time? Absolutely. That's when we anticipate that this event will start to wane, right? You nailed it. When the birds are congregating, they're flying north in these large, large flocks. That's where there's a, well, let's say there's a little less social distancing, Mm -hmm. right? That's a term we didn't used to know, but over (laughs) the last couple of years, we have a pretty good idea what social distancing looks like. Once they get to the nesting grounds, with that exception of snow geese, <clears throat> we anticipate, yeah, if, if ducks are taking this north, there could be localized impacts, right. you know, at very localized impacts, but they're not aggregating, right? So this virus has an opportunity really to kind of, you know, wane through the summer months. But the snow geese, like you said, they're a different story. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens if snow geese take this all the way up to their, you know, nesting breeding grounds up north. What happens with the virus and what could happen in the fall? Like I said, my crystal ball just never has worked. But that's why we just keep our eyes open. We keep watching, you know, to see what's going on. But, yeah, this will wane through the spring in through the summer. But last year, the same thing happened in Europe, right? It waned through the summer, but then it came back in the fall and the winter months. That's what I say. This one is behaving differently. So I think it's unpredictable right now what we're going to see this fall and winter, but we're sure going to keep our eyes open, that's for sure. What about um, th- this thoughts on this, and this makes me sound probably not very good, but God has a way of taking care of it. Or Mother Nature has a way of taking care of its own, and the snow geese are out of control. So if this wiped out 10 or 20% of the snow goose population, it's really in the long-term effects is not a bad thing for the snow goose population, is it? And it's probably a horrible thing for me to say, but it's realistic. Yeah, I got to be careful there because, you know, some <laughs> lots of hunters like to see a lot of snow geese enjoy the conservation season. Of course. But as right. we mentioned before, when I was growing up, there was no such thing. Me too. What's a conservation season? You know, shooting geese in March, that's, that's crazy talk, right? Mm-hmm. But now it's become commonplace. And it is a management response to exceptionally high numbers and densities of light geese and the impacts that they've had over the past 20 to 30 years on the breeding grounds. So, yeah, I think there's, I'd always heard that, you know, Mother Nature bats last. Yeah. 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 And she, and she's got a big swing. (laughs) And, And, you know, she's she's doing her damnedest to try to wipe us all out every minute of every day and we're just we're so insulated we don't really see that but you know one little bitty one little bitty blip on the radar can turn into something like we're seeing now something that's just cascades and before you know it it's a major problem and i'm not trying to be horrible on my thoughts towards any kind i I love wildlife and i love but but there's comes a time where something like this if it wiped out of 20, 20% of the snow geese, that's what the, that's what we're trying to do with the conservation season anyways, is get the balance right. And Mother Nature has a way of doing it. We don't want to see it wipe out everything else, but the, the snow goose, they're the ones that stay, they stay congregated pretty thick together on the nesting grounds where everybody else spreads out a little bit. Is that, tr- is that correct? Yeah, that's my, that's my understanding. And that's why the impacts on those breeding grounds, nesting grounds have been so dramatic. I remember some of the footage seeing, you know, 20 years ago, it's just, they're hard on, they're hard on the nesting ground up there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, the other one I'm, I, a lot of us have had concerns about, you know, I mentioned the common cranes over in, in Israel. Yes. Well, the last few weeks, a majority of our our Western population of Sandhill cranes and quite a few of, um, of our endangered cranes, you know, well, whoopers have spent about two weeks on about a 60 mile segment of the Platte river 
in Nebraska, right? And so we were greatly concerned at the conservation level, at the population level, if virus got into that population, what it could do. Now, I think there's no question whatsoever that the virus was in there when the cranes were there. There's a lot of cranes were there. And I'm going to ask you guys to please knock on wood with me, you know, because, you know, so far we haven't seen any impacts in those cranes. Right. Now, the virus is there. But so I've got some good friends at the International Crane Foundation up in Baraboo, Wisconsin, and I talked with their lead veterinarian, you know, Dr. Barry Hardup, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And he put, again, he was knocking on wood, but he put my heart a little bit at ease. And the comparison there, remember those birds over in Israel were packed in, mm -hmm. tightly packed in and artificially fed. So even the footage, and if you've been to the Platte River during the spring migration, it's a fantastic place to see thousands and thousands and thousands of cranes. But you know what? they practice a little bit of that social distancing as well. While the densities look super, super high, they're not nearly what they were in that similar, in that situation in Israel. Plus we're not artificially feeding those birds. So they're going out in fields, you know, during the daytime where there's snow geese. So there's certainly infectious agent there. And then they're coming back into the water, you know, at, at night in large numbers but those large numbers are still not at all what was witnessed in Israel. So again, knock on wood. And, and you know, um, Dr. Hardup said, yeah, wouldn't be surprised at all to see some bird losses. That would be normal. But thousands and thousands, we're optimistic right now that we won't see that in cranes because that would be a big deal, especially with the whoopers, right? Right. Yeah, there's not too many of them around right now anyway. Um, is this similar to CWD in deer? Oh, it's happening in birds, though. Is it kind of the same neurological effect in the brain? Apples and oranges, I'd okay. have to say. Okay. Um, you know, CWD is caused by, you know, a malformed protein called a prion, mm -hmm. right? And, and causes effects in individual animals, long-term potential impacts at the population level. This is a virus, so completely different. I guess the analogy here, you know, would be epizootic hemorrhagic disease or EHD in deer, where we see some substantial, you know, die-offs at the county level. You could lose 70, 80, 90% of the deer in, in a localized area. But in the fall, when you get your first frost, EHD goes away right? It die, you know, it, you know, the first frost kills off the midges, you know, the noceums, which are transmitting it. So I'd say, you know, the outbreaks we're seeing in, in, in water birds right now are loosely more associated or similar to EHD than they are with chronic wasting disease. CWD is a, is a, is a horse of a completely different color with regard to, you know, the disease itself and disease impacts. Right. But over the long haul, you know, there's certainly conservation level concerns about what CWD is going to do out there. What are you, what are you more concerned with? If you had to put, if you had to like categorize, are you more concerned with CWD long-term or this, or are they both kind of something that you're going to monitor closely over the next couple of years, months? I mean, if this fades out, so if this phases out in, in the summertime, then we're not even talking about it by the time, you know, hunting season rolls around. Yeah, I think they're different concerns. Mm -hmm. I think we we monitor wildlife diseases. That's what at the National Wildlife Health Center. That's what our forte is: is trying to look at the impacts of disease on on wildlife health. So this is a biggie. And it's been building, you know, like I mentioned, you know, this particular clade of viruses, you know, the first time it appeared was 1997. It's ebbed and flowed, waxed and waned, you know, in both the domestic and the wild birds since that point in time. And the last, you know, we had a big, you know, outbreak in 2014-15 here in, in North America. And this one um, is ongoing. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um at the, at the population level, I think we've discussed, um, you know, it's really hard on individual raptors, hard locally on some, you know, goose populations. The light geese, we'll have to wait and see what happens when it gets up to up to the breeding grounds. So if, I don't, uh, and even if it doesn't come back this fall, it's still going on. 
Right. It's still going on in Europe and Asia. And so we have to be vigilant, you know, for, you know, into the future for these additional incursions. You know, even if it goes away on this side of the ponds right now, it'll probably come back or there's a good likelihood it'll, it'll come back, you know, through flyway, you know, through uh, uh, migratory movements or, um, you know, vagrants flying across in storms, things like that. It'll come back. CWD is a little different. It's out there. You know, it's progressive. It's marching across the country at a very, very slow rate in individual populations, you know, just a little bit north and west of where I am in Iowa County, uh, Wisconsin and free ranging deer. We've got prevalence or the proportion positive in adult male deer, those two and a half and older. It's over 50 percent. Wow. So in that county, you know, you, you shoot a, you know, three and a half, four and a half year old buck or even a two and a half year old buck literally take a quarter out of your pocket, flip it in the air. And, and, and that's the chances that, that deer has CWD. And that's an always fatal contagious neurological disorder. So again, it's been out there. There have not been dramatic die offs, but when you start getting disease processes in, you know, upwards a third or a half of a free ranging population, you got to wonder about those long-term impacts. You really got to wonder. Yeah. And that's, when was the first case of CWD? First time it was described was in 1967, and that was in a research facility out in the state of Colorado. Um, Then the first time it was really picked up in in free-ranging animals, again, was in the northeast Colorado, southeast Wyoming area, uh, late 70s and early 80s. And it's, you know, it wasn't doing much out there, Um, certainly spreading slowly, just this enigma of a disease. And then, um, you know, in the late 90s, we started seeing it in in commercial deer farms, you know, in multiple states and up in Canada. Then in 2002 was the first detection in Wisconsin. And that was a big deal. That was 900 miles east of where it ever been picked up before in, in, in wild deer across the Mississippi River. So, you know, not likely that deer walked it to Wisconsin. A person brought it to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether it was a live deer, dead deer, you know, honestly, at this point in time, it doesn't matter. But that disease has performed exceptionally well in southwestern Wisconsin to the point where, you know, we see it in, you know, in a third to half, you know, depending on whether you're talking adult does or adult males or even yearling males. You know, some of these counties now we're seeing, you know, uh, one of three yearling males, you know, positive and high proportions of females. So in, and remember in 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 the deer world, the bucks are are you don't need many bucks for the population to keep going. Right. It's the does who are really important to the to the viability of the species in the herd. So when you get a third of your adult females in a in a herd or a geographic area positive for CWD really impacts their lifetime productivity. So they're not, you know, CWD, like any disease, fatal disease, shortens your lifespan, right? Shortens it substantially. So if you shorten a doe's lifespan by four or five years, you know, you're you're really reducing the number of fawns she puts out there for future generations, Mm -hmm. right? So when you get CWD prevalence up in that 30 plus range, you're really, you know, that, that deer's die, you know, she's going to die either from the disease or something else that's going to kill her because she's has, you know, progressive neurologic signs, but her contribution to future generations is greatly curtailed. So when you get up to a third of the population with that impact, yeah, you start, you start playing numbers games and yeah, now, you got to think about the, the long-term impacts. How is, is that spread through saliva? How is CWD spread in, in deer and these type of animals? Yeah, great, great question. So this infectious agent, the prion protein, you know, is coming out both ends of the deer, okay. you know, during the clinical phase. A lot of prion protein in their saliva and ocular exudates from the eyes and coming out the back end as well. And so... Infected animals are shedding that infectious agent, and then healthy, naive, susceptible animals are either inhaling or ingesting that infectious agent. And that's exactly the same mechanism as what we have with avian influenza, Mm -hmm. where avian influenza is thought of as a fecal-oral 
you know, transmission mechanisms. So that's when you got a lot of waterfowl out there on the water. Some of them are pooping, literally pooping, you know, live virus out into the water where others are, are ingesting it. So that's that fecal oral transmission route. Right. And, you know, we said something about the cranes earlier. My understand. So I wonder if there's a difference in the way waterfowl roost on water and the way that cranes roost on water, because waterfowl, you, you see a lot. They stay on like lakes and stuff, whereas here and in Nebraska, they're they're roosting on like a riverbed. So the water is moving underneath them. It's not that stagnant water where they're just pooping and also drinking it, it's kind of going down. It's it's flushing itself out on these river systems. I wonder if that could be a possibility of why it's not gone to cranes. I'll take any any factor we can have to keep it from going into cranes to have those impacts. So I think you're likely right. And, you know, yeah, you think about the differences. Um, yeah, they're foraging a little bit, but not like dabblers are, right? Right. They're in the water, they're yeah. down, you know, so there's a, there's an obvious mechanism for them to, you know, ingest, you know, live virus. Whereas the cranes are probably foraging a little bit more, you know, on the shore, right? Mm -hmm. So if the virus is in the water, which it likely is, their mechanism for being exposed is a little bit different, you know, than the dabblers or the shorebirds as well that are in there. Right. You yeah, know, I think in right now the only one I'm aware of in 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 the U.S. is sanderlings, and we've had a few, but you know, shorebirds are definitely susceptible as well because they're right in that same type environment. Now, going back to Israel, where the people were just where they were just throwing corn and bird seed out to these cranes, and that's how they were getting it, and we don't see that in Nebraska. That's a lot to do with it, the, the intense concentration and the artificial feeding. Now, I don't know if there's any level of, um, you know, corporate level or, you know, purposeful government, you know, feeding of the cranes. It's a green space, so it's very viable, but there's a lot of visitors. And so it's a tremendous um, tourist uh, type attraction. And it's my understanding that feeding is allowed, you know, by tourists. So... Again, similar, you think about, you know, Canada geese at a, at a, at a metro park in yeah. the United States where the geese will walk right up to you. Well, why is that? Well, it's because people have been feeding them, you yeah. know, so they know that that's a common food source. So you put them in that situation and at that, and at that, you know, metro park with Canada geese, you know, you got to wash your shoes off after you're there, right? Oh, yeah. And that's from all the goose poop on the ground. So, you know, if that goose poop is laden with, you know, active virus, you know, pulling them all together by throwing the bread comes out on the ground, I think you can see how that enhances the risk of disease transmission. Right. Yeah, that would make sense. So going back to CWD, why has, why has Wisconsin done so why has it been the focal point and not uh, – because you look at it, it's just a hotbed. Is it is it just perfect weather conditions? In your estimation, why is it there so heavily? Yeah, so how it got here is is anybody's guess, but it was certainly – you know, we would say it's anthropogenic or humans brought the brought the infectious material here. It's done amazingly well here, but it's not the only place. So mm -hmm. it's likely a combination of things like, you know, relatively high deer densities. We also, you know, in Iowa, Richland, Sauk counties, Vernon counties, we have this tremendous interspersion of agricultural land with steep ridges and valleys. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of deer movement back and forth. Our soil types may be conducive towards, you know, the infectious agent persisting out in the environment as well. So it's done really well. It's not the only place. Um, recent reports from the South Saskatchewan River Valley, you know, up in, up, in, up in Saskatchewan, they figure in adult males, they're pushing over two thirds, maybe pushing 70 percent prevalence wow. in adult males up in up in that system along the river valley. And so you think again about a, a, a riparian system. You know, where there's a lot of, of open agricultural fields where the deer can go out during the daytime and they come back into that riparian system at night where there's, you know, relatively high densities of, of animals. And that just increases the odds of, of transmission. So we've got a hot spot, you know, up there. 
Um, prevalence in some areas of Wyoming and, and northeastern Colorado are pretty high. We've got another little hotbed, or I guess what I would refer to as a, you know, as a hotbed over in south central Pennsylvania right now, um, where it's been there. Now, yeah, hard to say how long it's been there, but it looks like it's the, the disease is, is behaving out of control in that situation. Another one is, uh, is Arkansas, where you know, disease was picked up for the first time, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And when they detected it, you know, it was at a fairly high prevalence already, maybe in that 20% range already. And then we've got another you know, um, outbreak in southwestern you know, Tennessee, and that crosses over into northern Mississippi as well where it's already in that 20, maybe 25% prevalence range. So Wisconsin, we just, we saw it a little bit earlier in the early 2000s, but clearly disease has been dropped, you know, along, out in the landscape in multiple geographic locations. Like I said, it's just going to be interesting to watch this over time. You know, sometimes it's argued that, oh, it's, it's likely always been there and we just didn't pick it up. But this pattern of, of observing it on the landscape and then watching it grow and spread, it's kind of like a volcano. Mm -hmm. you know, it grows in prevalence, and then it kind of, that lava kind of shoots down and progresses out in, in a, in a uh, dispersal pattern, kind of concentric dispersal pattern out across the landscape. So once you notice it in your area, it's, prob it's probably taken hold. The, the odds of you finding the one deer in your area that has this that has this is probably pretty, pretty slim. Yeah. Um, typically when you find disease, it's already there and, yeah. and established. You think about, let's, let's go back to our surveillance patterns and it's the same thing. We talked about surveillance for high path AI. The goals of that surveillance mentioned our early detection, situational awareness and warning out to, you know, maybe the agricultural sector. Hey, it's out here. We look for disease in um, watershed units, fairly small watershed units, and you're trying to sample enough waterfowl, and that's from hunter kills or from live ducks, you know, you're swabbing those animals to try and detect disease at a 1% prevalence, or one out of 100 is positive, and you wanna pick it up with 95% confidence. You're 19 out of 20 sure that if it's there at 1%, you'll find it. And that surveillance has been overwhelmingly successful, you know, in, the, in North America and the United States this time around. We're detecting it out on the landscape and providing that situational awareness out to, you know, the multiple sectors. Most of the states are looking for CWD at the same level. Mm -hmm. Their surveillance is designed to pick up CWD at 1% levels, again, with that 95% confidence that you're going to find it. Well, let's, let's, you know, knock those numbers out. You know, if you've got, you know, uh, if your herd unit's a thousand animals and you find it at 1%, well, that's 10 of them. If, you know, in the, in the Edwards Plateau of Texas, what, there's a couple million deer out there, something like that in the hill country. Well, what's 1% of that? Well, 1% of a million is what, you know, 10,000. Yeah. If you've got 10,000 CWD positive deer, that moves it into the, the category of being endemic or established in that population where any sort of management interventions to try and eliminate disease, uh, your odds are diminishing. Odds of success are diminishing in that situation. So we do surveillance based on, on these statistical formulas, trying to detect it when it's fairly low. Um, and in the instance of high path AI, it's really great to find it at 1% because it really provides that, that early warning situational awareness. CWD, 1% is a big number. Right. Yeah. Really big number. Is there any, is there any instance in your mind where, I mean, like you said, there's a million deer, 1% is 10,000. Like that's, you're never gonna, you're never gonna get ahead of that. So like, what could you do? Is there anything that can be done? to get ahead of this or is it just going to have to kind of run its course, whatever that may be? Tough question. And a lot of the states are struggling with that. And a lot of hunters are struggling with that question as well. There's guidance put out by the Western states group called WAFO, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. 
And a few years ago, they put up uh, management recommendations for CWD. It's easy to find if you, if, you, you know, if you use Dr. Google to find it. And so what they recognized is that once CWD becomes established in a population, you're likely not going to get rid of it. But that responsible management agencies owe it to their stakeholders and owe it to the resource to do as much as they can to try and reduce the potential for devastating population level impacts, right? So states are recognizing it's, it's, a, it's better to try and do something. So there's a lot of research going on into things like vaccines, genetic resistance, and, and, and things like that. Maybe those offer some promise in the longer term, but likely not in the shorter term, at least for free ranging populations. So what we have is the same tools we've always had. I don't know if you guys ever ever heard of a guy named Al, named Aldo Leopold, right? Mm-hmm. You know, father of wildlife management. He identified back in the 1930s kind of our toolkit that we have for wildlife management. He listed things like the plow, the cow, the axe, and fire. These were things that we could use to alter habitat, to either make it better for wildlife or poorer for, for wildlife. Then he identified a fifth tool called the gun Mm -hmm. and that's how we manage populations so here we are 90 years after leopold you know put those words down we still have the same tools today and so when we think about the gun you know that's how we manage you know populations that's that conservation season for light geese that's how we manage deer and so use of the gun offers promise right So we know that males are much more likely to have CWD than females, you know, adult males anyway. So it makes sense. If you're trying to perform surgery, you know, on a population, you want to perform surgery for a disease on those that have the disease as opposed to those that are healthy, right? So if all we have to go on are odds ratios, we know that adult males are more likely to have disease, and we want to we want to use our tool, our gun, you know, our collective gun in a surgical fashion. Well, then it makes a lot of sense to focus on adult males, right? Right, where we might be able to have some impacts to not eliminate disease, but to reduce disease out there at the population level. Okay, well now. Think about the whole concept of quality deer management and and what a lot of hunters really enjoy hunting, you know, for mature males, right? Mm -hmm. So the suggested medicine for CWD goes contrary to what a lot of people hunt for. So it's really challenging. That gets into, and, you know, with waterfowl hunting, it's the same thing, the human dimensions factor of of how we manage populations is is quite different leopold had another thing you know he identified that management was a three-legged stool you've got population management you've got habitat management and you've got people management <laughs> and sometimes the people management is the hardest of that three legs on the three-legged stool to actually impact you know yeah. and now as you know with internet social media you know, uh, rumors fly faster than they ever did. Sure. Uh, but having stakeholder support, be it for conservation seasons, for light geese, for for trying to alter disease processes, or even just keep wildlife populations within what what habitat can truly support. That's all the people management part, right? And it's really challenging. Yeah. That's where you guys come in. <laughs> you guys talk to more people than I ever could. So getting the messages out there, the right management messages out there is what you guys excel in. And and, and that's what, you know, back on you, right? Yeah, exactly. Why do, why is, why is CWD more prevalent in adult males than, than females? Is it because their nose is kind of at the rooter of, of these does and that's how they're getting it or, or the tutor, I guess. Great question. Great question. I believe on the tutor. It's, Yeah, I believe it's likely due to the behavior patterns that we see. So females tend to hang in their familial groups. You know, they hang with their sisters and their offspring in social groups that are primarily made up of family members. Now, those social groups do interact over time, 
right? But that's a little bit different. You know, at least with the white-tailed deer, you know, the guys have some, some different behavior patterns. So during the summer and fall, they hang together in these things we term bachelor groups. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of males will hang together, and there's a lot of social grooming and interactions early in the fall. Then later on in the fall, you know, during breeding season, they go into rut. And these mature males, at least, will greatly expand the size of their home range, you know, out to, you know, you know, multiple times larger home range, and they're interacting up close and personal with a lot of different social groups of females. So just be, due to their behavior patterns, it's likely that they are exposed to, um, you know, the CWD prions at a higher rate. So they, and, and on, the, on the flip side, if they're infected, you know, they can be spreaders of disease as well. So they're sinks and spreaders. You know, your adult males are probably the best, ba best way I can explain that. Yeah. So they, they get it from these localized females <clears throat> and then they go out and try to spread their seed and then, then they spread it on to, to uh, and then like you said, you know, I mean, if they're fighting with other adult males, there's a saliva transfer and they're up close and personal and, I don't do a whole lot of deer hunting, but I got to assume they're a little bit like a dog where they're sniffing each other's butts and, you know, all this, see what's going on down there. Um, that's what my dog does. That's what mine does too. <laughs> it, even, you know, he's a little bit of a pervert. Well, listen, we have kept you long <laughs> enough. This has been, uh, extremely informative. Um, one other question, um, the banding surveys, will when they swab these ducks and geese, will they be, uh, monitoring to see if this uh avian flu is prevalent or present in uh the ducks and geese and cranes and swans that they're banding this this spring and summer i'm assuming that there will be a lot of uh of testing you know in that this is an opportunity why not leverage it mm -hmm. there's another portion there that's pretty interesting and it's on you know if you've ever done uh, float trap banding for ducks mm -hmm. you use baited platforms right? right so you put corn on the baited platforms and they're the walk-in traps and so now you think about that you're artificially congregating ducks into that trap so could you be inadvertently increasing the risk of transmission. Wow. And so that's a big conversation, but I think that's localized. Now here's the flip side of the coin. The last two years, a lot due to COVID, SARS-CoV-2, you know, banding operations have not been what they historically were. Right. So banding operations are incredibly important to learn about population status of, you know, our, our migratory waterfowl in North America. It's one of the bases of how we establish, you know, harvest regulations, you know, across the flyways and across the continents. So banding's really, really important. And so I think states and the flyway councils are really weighing, you know, the the benefits of banding versus any potential enhanced risk and that risk likely is at that very localized scale you know so but it's it's a great question and it's where you know management has to really consider you know the pros and cons of everything they do mm -hmm. that's what's so interesting is so many people think that they have the answers well we'll just do this and then we'll get this outcome but they don't understand that introducing just one unknown agent into this into this population, it could have effects that nobody even saw coming. Just like you said, like banding is such a, a useful resource to waterfowl hunters and tracking the migration. And um, it could be a tool to detect this flu in birds. But it could also be the point where you're you're artificially congregating a lot of ducks and a lot of geese this time of year. And it could be a, 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 a spreader event. Yep, absolutely. Um, there's implications and uh, repercussions from just about everything we do out there, right? It's crazy. And yeah. I, th I think now with, with COVID and, and everything that we've just kind of come through, I think people are kind of seeing that more and more. But, you know, everybody just thinks that the answers are just so cr clear cut, and it's not. There, there's implications far beyond what you ever thought that there, that there might be. So, um, 
I really, exactly. really, I really, really appreciate your time. Hey, 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 yeah. Now, before you go, you mentioned dogs. And yes, sir. So, you know, there's, I've got to tell you at least one little story before we quit. <laughs> and it's a friend of mine who's a wildlife biologist and an avid duck hunter and kind of a statistician. And he said a couple of years ago out on opening day um, in the state of Iowa, uh, duck hunting he said, you know, there's, there's blinds out everywhere. There were sets out everywhere and the dogs pre-dawn or, you know, all antsy and, and everything like that. You know, about first light, you know, you know, ducks started coming over and there's gunfire out there. Ducks are dropping down. He said the dogs are just going crazy out of control. All the dogs are out in the water. And my friend, the statistician, you know, he said, you know, he kind of figured out why the pandemonium you know, reached the way it was. Turns out all these, all these dogs pretty much had the same name because all the hunters were out there yelling, God dang it. At the top of their voices. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> Jeff's, uh, Jeff's dad and my grandfather, he trained dogs for a living. So, um, you know, he, they, they heard a lot. That's how Jeff thought that's what his name was for the longest time. Yeah. I was in third grade before gosh, damn it. Jeff wasn't my name. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, I thought I'd add a little bit of levity to uh, I appreciate interesting it. Yeah. conversation. Yeah, it is. And listen, we, we really appreciate your time, and uh, we appreciate you you sharing our wisdom. And, um, you know, hopefully this thing kind of wanes in the, in the summer months. Um, in your estimation, before we let you go, one last question that just came to me. When, if this persists through the summer months, if we're still talking about this in August, could you expect to see some sort of, I don't, I don't even know what the word would be, some sort of um, uh, alteration to the hunting season and, and how waterfowlers uh, get out there, if we're still talking about this in July, August? It'd be hard to see that right now. Okay. You know, it's hard to see that, but again, my crystal ball. If we see, um, I anticipate we'll probably be looking at, you know, teal season. Yeah. Where that's the first opportunity in the fall to start doing some intensive surveillance, you know, based on, on hunters. And the duck hunters have been so fantastic, you know, at, at landings. They allow, you know, folks from USDA, from the states to swab those ducks to look for, you know, look for evidence of disease. And so that cooperation is important. But I really can't foresee, but I'm not a manager. Right. You know, that's a question for the flyway councils, for Fish and Wildlife Service, and for the states. But right now, I don't see evidence of those population level impacts in any of these birds as they're headed north. But we have to wait and see. They're right. going to disperse out there on the on the breeding, you know, on the nesting grounds, other than, like we said, the light geese. Um, so we have to wait and see, hope for the best, practice vigilance, you know, practice good, you know, wash your hands, you know, uh, don't stick your hands in your mouth when you're dressing your game, stuff like that. Makes sense. And the other thing, you know, before we go, I got to give hats off to, you know, our partners in this. The states have been fantastic. Um, the ag departments managing on the commercial side, the natural resource agencies, including parks and wildlife and, you know, and game and parks in Nebraska. These folks are out there, you know, running and gunning, uh, working with the, the, the truly dedicated folks from USDA Wildlife Services to try and get this information, you know, to make it available, you know, for everybody. And so these, these you know, natural resource professionals are, are amazing people. You know, there's no stopping them. Yeah, they're just going long hours, seven days a week to do the right thing for the natural resources that you and I, you know, get to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Sure. So hats off to all of them. Very good. Well, you uh, you go enjoy that fresh uh, snowfall up there in, in Wisconsin, and uh, hopefully you get out. Uh, I don't know what your, your spring habits are, but maybe you'll go shoot a turkey this spring, and we wish you the best, and thank you so much for coming on here, sir. Thanks a bunch. Have thank, a great day, you thank guys. Thank you, Brian. God bless you, and have you. a great day. Yes, thank sir. you, sir. Bye-bye. Yeah. Adios. Brian Richards, smart, smart man. Those guys, they're, they're, the – degree of intelligence is amazing on these people him the virologist we had on the the, the guy that did the hip certification from yeah, oregon Brad. yeah i mean all of them just wow they're i mean you know it's it's they're professionals that's the kind of people that we want in charge yes. of these 
Uh, well, when and, you look and, at our president, you don't see that. Well, um, did you see Kamala today? I did not. God, oh you know, another you thing. Yeah, uh, one other, and we didn't get to touch on this with him, but um, there's also a big push from what I was doing a lot of research. There's also a big push to get the chicken industry to where it's all free range. So, so what? Could, could, so what? It's going to compound because all these chicken, all these chicken companies are not only are they having to look at this, but they're also um, being pushed to expand their facilities and give chickens free range. So there was one chicken farm, I think it was in Pennsylvania. Now, his chicken farms, the chickens have 67 square inches of space. That's about the sheet of a paper. About the sheet of a paper. They're 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 they're, it's a they're they're like a vegetable. They're grown to kill. I understand, but now as we're getting as we're looking at this more humanely, there's a big push. The talk is that they're going to force a lot of these companies to either expand your operation and be quote unquote cage free, um, or you're going to get, you know, sanctions put on you. So one guy's looking at it as like. I've got to I've got to invest millions of dollars into my operation, and if I get this disease, it's going to wipe out my entire chicken population. I'll never survive this. Yeah, I don't. I, but there's one company that is just taking over the chicken market. Tyson. I I can't remember what I could look it up real quick, but Cargill something like that. Here, here's the thing: a chicken is a food source. Sure. No more than growing corn outside. People get over it. They're not they're not pets. They're not they're not you know. Grandma Tucket or whatever you want to name your chicken that's in your backyard, it's eggs. These animals are raised for food source. What's the difference when fish? We've got these big tanks with fish, crawfish, crabs, lobster, everything that they farm and raise nowadays. Mm. What What's the difference with them? We're going to give them an open ocean to go to? I mean, we got to figure out if we want to sustain and be able to eat or do we want to fucking live like Indians did because that's what it's coming down to. I mean, these free-range people that want these free-range chickens and stuff, they don't even know how to clean a chicken. <laughs> you know? to find and did you know that England had rednecks? Mm-mm. Cal Mains is pouring whatever company that is. Yeah. Cal Mains pouring hundreds of millions into becoming the leading cage free producer. Um, that it, guy it's that a, it's an interesting that guy that lived out here that was going to be uh, there was a big con artist guy that had that big plans on the ranch sure. north of town. His deal was to have free range chickens. Wanted to raise fifty thousand or half a million or whatever it was of free range. And I, I went to a meeting one time, and I'm like, how are you going to just turn loose the half million chickens? you think they're just going to come back in and get in the pens every night? Right. There's going to be more damn coyotes and varmints around that place well, than Well, I don't know that cage-free is the right is exactly true. I think it's just, it's a cage, but it's, you got acres that you can go do your shit yeah. on. You're going to do a high-fence varmint You're basically free. doing a high-fence yeah a high fence chicken farm. But I just don't. I, but, I mean, you know, if... It, chicken's a food source, just like the hogs is. are. Are we going to do free-range hogs? Those, those animals are raised for six months, and it's sad, but that is what they are. They are a food source. They're not a pet. We're not. They're not. A, they're not a Labrador retriever that's going to retrieve your ducks. They are a food source. That's all they are. You know, fish, chicken, pigs. That's what they're raised for. You know. So, you know, are, should we start raising corn? You know, wild. Well, I mean, but corn, I mean, corn doesn't have feelings, Jeff. No, it don't. But it's the same. I, I just either want to eat or you don't want to eat. Anyways, the English redneck. Can you imagine sleeping in a room with the ducks? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's just. I mean, there's just that's I, how shit gets. I, I wouldn't. I, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I could are you not imagine. The guy got. No, no, I, I, I'm not shocked at all. But I mean, could you imagine going home? Could you imagine the smell in that house? No, just chickens and duck shit you know what? everywhere. Bill Clinton went to Cambridge. Uh huh. So he took a little bit of Arkansas with him to England is what happened there. Uh, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, that was an interesting podcast. Um, I think, you know, I think we're on such high alert right now coming through COVID that we're just, we're, we see this and then we automatically panic. But I saw some of those videos on Facebook of the, of the snow goose and his yes. head's just bobbing. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, I've seen deer this that had it. that same. CWD? I don't know if they had CWD, but we had a deer that 
I was, just I was real lethargic. Just didn't hardly move around at all. And they ended up putting right. it down, and they, I don't think they sent it off to see if it had CWD. I don't know if it did or it didn't. Um, but I think we're just so like tense and wound tight yes. about the next, the we're, next big thing that's going to come through and just completely wreck our system. And, we're hypersensitive to it. And then with the expansion of social media, it just takes one video to go viral, and you see all these snow geese on a pond, and you're like, oh shit, here it is. But I mean, it makes a lot of sense that. It's, I, except for the snow geese. I hope this don't bite me in the ass, but I'm not really worried about it with the wild, with with wildfowl, whether it be ducks, snow geese, everything. Right. But what concerns me is if it got into our food supply sure. or a bunch of chicken houses. Yeah, that that's that's more of the of what I'm worried about after talking to him, rather than we're going to have to be worried about this this waterfowl like, season. Like, well, yes, but let's, let's just talk about the chicken stuff though. Mom and me were talking about this last night. Eggs. Mm-hmm. We don't serve eggs here at the lodge in the morning. Right. But we use eggs every day here for stuff she bakes, sure. cooks, whatever we do. We have eggs all the time here. Yeah. You the, the, you talking about wiping out our egg supply. You know, that would really, really, really. There's no there's no, there's no, no alternative to that. Mm-mm. And then um, in chicken is a cheap protein, like you said, that a lot of people rely on that to eat because they can't afford beef. Right. And... You talk about wiping out, right now we're at 3%. Let's say it's 30%. So yeah. we lose a third of our chickens. That means the price is going to probably double or triple. Mm-hmm. You know, And then you're talking about poor people that can't afford that. It's uh, definitely an interesting time, but it's been an interesting time. This whole The sky has been falling since we started this podcast. I'm, I'm starting to think we were the catalyst for all this because we had like six months of, of normalcy starting this podcast. And no, then we it had was, two years. We had uh, all of 18 and all of 19. We kind of, no, because th- COVID came on in the fall of 19. We were kind of laughing about it. We, we it, they it, shut it us down in, in the 2020. spring of 20. Right. March of 2020. But we knew it about it from people that go over to China in September we and October. About, we yes. laughed about it in, during dove season. Yeah. Like, oh, don't go over there and get the Chinese flu. I'm going to tell you that. So uh, that was 19. We had a year and a half, I guess. Someone today, I, I was reading on Twitter, was talking about all the stuff going on, and they said, now Jamaica, we got to send Jamaica a bunch of money. Why? Fuck, I don't have a fucking clue, but I saw Kamala went on some big rant, and it made absolutely no sense what she said. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to read this just so you can laugh at our the vice president, because she is, I don't know how the lady got through fucking uh, law school. I, I do not have a clue. I mean, I really don't. Let me see if I can get it. For Jamaica, one of the issues that has been presented as an issue that is economic in the way its impact has been the pandemic. We will assist Jamaica in COVID recovery by assisting in terms of the recovery efforts in Jamaica that have been essential. Now, what the fuck did she just say? What does that even mean? Nobody knows. That's that's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of shit. How in the fuck did she ever get out of law school? Yeah, that's word salad right there. That's exactly what everybody said. It was one of them term papers that you've got to write a thousand words yeah, and you're just you're trying, trying to fill to in the... shit. Absolutely ridiculous. But th- why do we have to give Jamaica money? Somebody said, you know, we print money like we're not broke. <laughs> we are fucking broke, and we're just giving money to everybody. Mm-hmm. How about if we've got all this extra money to give everybody, let's lower all of our taxes. Right. You know? Yeah. And um, had the first casualty of the uh, income tax child tax credits the other day. I had a person in town wanted to know why they're not getting bigger tax. The you, you took it through tax the year. refund because you got it every month, right? You know what did you expect? Yeah, you know you're not going to get the nine thousand dollar Christmas in February check you normally get that working right. people don't get because you got six hundred dollars or what? What is it per kid? I can't remember what it is. Um, Two hundred, three hundred dollars a kid per month, isn't it? I want to say something like that. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it is. But those people that were getting a thousand dollars a month, all of a sudden they're not getting the nine thousand dollars they normally right. get in they, February. They took their smaller payment throughout the year. Throughout the so. year. All right. Anyways, thank y'all for listening to us. Getting off a tangent here. Uh, <laughs> next week we will have Reed Timmer. Reed Timmer will be on with us. Stale Cracker, the Cajun Chef, will be on with us, and. Somebody else is going to be on next week. Maybe James Washington and Gus West. I can't remember who I've talked to. We did say the April 4th week. Um, of James and Gus? That's what we had said. And then so the we'll week see. after that, uh, a buddy of mine just climbed Mount Everest, and he's going to be on with us, and we're going to talk about him climbing Mount Everest. And I've got a big guest for May. So. Well, good deal. All right. Thank you all for listening to us. God bless you all, and have a great week. Check out all of our great sponsors before you get out of here. Check out Dive Bomb Industries, Pacific Calls, Shin Gear Waiters, 
Uh, Bosch Hot Shells, Alpha Outdoors, Dirty Duck Coffee, Lucky Duck, Looking Glass Duck Club Podcast, Gun Dog Outdoors, Steak Plains Meat, Stanford Hunt Outfitters, and Bangtail Whiskey.